So now I want to turn it over to Will Leach. Will Leach and I have worked together. I uh, actually hired his wife on my team. I was leading a team called the Center for Human Understanding at Frito-Lay back in 2005. Uh, Will joined about that time the Shopper Insights team and began the journey of thinking about this thing called the Smart Learning Center. Uh, he rotated off sometime after the Smart Learning Center uh, opened. I took it over for two and a half years. I left Peps to, for the PepsiCo side, and you took it over at some point there. So he comes from working on the, in the behavioral labs uh, for Brain Juicer, and now he has a company called Trigger Point. He does teach a four-hour session at, uh, in the business school at SMU. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Will. He's a fantastic speaker. Give it up for Will. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Guys in the back, you okay? Feeling it? I'm getting you out of here fast. I promise. I promise. We're going to get back on, on track here. Uh, thanks for having me, everybody. My name is Will Leach. I am the founder of Trigger Point. We are a behavioral research and design company. I'm going to take our conversation into a little bit different place right now. Um, we've been hearing great things for the last couple of hours around implicit association, great new types of research out there that can really help us understand behaviors. What I want to do, and what I've been focused on the last couple of years here, is what do we do with that work? What do we do with this research, and how do we apply it to actually change people's behaviors by becoming what I would term as a behavioral designer? So let's start off with uh, a fact here. CEOs think we lie. And if they don't think we lie, here's what they do think. They think we're not exactly great at our jobs. And uh, I would say this for marketing and insights, right? And it's not just me just saying this. I'm not trying to be too uh, profound here. It's actually coming from CEOs themselves. This is a study uh, conducted um, in 2012 by the Fournier's Marketing Group. And what they did is they went out and they interviewed about 1,200 CEOs globally. And they asked the CEOs, what's the power? What's the impact that marketers are having on your business? And it was really showing a really sad state of affairs. A lot of uh, key facts. The one I noticed here was that 78% of CEOs believe that marketers are disconnected. They're disconnected from real business results. What they suggested was that marketing out there, they're so interested in trying to get Facebook likes or go viral that they're not really focused every day on top line sales. They couldn't see it, in fact. They're like, well, they're trying to build these brands, but how do I see that brand really driving top line sales? I think there are two reasons that they're not able to see this, outside of the, the obvious that you know, it's very difficult to test brand equity and to know what the impact of brand equity is. I would say it's that most research and marketing is pretty antiquated. This room is in a different spot here. You're at this conference means that you're like looking forward ahead. Most people out there in the industry aren't looking ahead at all. Here's what I'd focus on first. On the research side, traditional research um, is in fact really bad at predicting people's future behaviors because it's all in stated stuff. We've been talking about that all day. But let's just say, in fact, that we did get a great business driving insight, and we knew exactly what the somebody, uh, somebody wanted, then traditional marketing is just as bad at actually taking that insight and creating new innovations and in marketing that drive behaviors. They're really, really bad at it. Um, let me talk a little bit about the research side of it first. We have to recognize that there is a problem in our industry that no amount of tape can fix. And we've been trying to tape up our industry for a long, long time here. The fact of the matter is, we're all trying to do better marketing research. And so here's what we do. We invest in new technologies to try to drive down costs. We invest in new technologies to try to go faster and maybe even better research, right? So we get better research. The problem with focusing on better research is that CEOs are telling us that's not what their issue is. CEOs want us to focus on changing a behavior. They want research to now start saying, what can I now do to change somebody's behavior to drive a sale, right? So right off the bat, we're so focused, I think, on building better research and doing better marketing research that we're not seeing the forest through the trees. CEOs want us to drive sales, not provide new insights. So if you're doing marketing research, I would suggest to you right now that you're in a commodity business. You are being outsourced every day, your stuff is going over to India to be outsourced, and do-it-yourself platforms are killing our industry. And hopefully nobody else out, out here uh, you know, you're promoting that stuff, but they are. Things like you know, SurveyMonkey things allows anybody these days to be a marketing researcher. And they are in your companies right now, and they're saying they have insights out there. So some of you right now are saying, I don't do marketing research, Will. I do strategic insights. Got it. What I would suggest to you is that strategic insights is fast becoming a commodity in, in organizations. Here's why. We all have many people in the organization that say they provide strategic insights. I worked at Pepsi for years. 
Let me tell you all the people that within PepsiCo that said they provided some amount of strategic insights to our CEO. Hit our group, insights. You had marketing. You had sales. You had finance and accounting. You had operations. And even sometimes IT would come in and they'd have some sort of a strategic insights function. They'd come in with an insight to tell the CEO how to drive a sale, how to increase a, a top line growth. Those are just people inside the company. Think about outside the company. Management consultants. You have ad agencies. You have forums like this where a CEO listens and hears an insight. All these insights are all just blending together in his mind. And he's just trying to figure out, well, what's going on with, with, with kind of all these things? So here's what insights departments do. I used to do the same thing. Now what I need to do is I need to break free from the morass of all the insights. My insights are important. So what do I do? I go invest in storytelling. My insights professionals are going to be really smart at storytelling. Or data visualization, you still do a little bit of that. Or I'd say, OK. Once I have that, I need to do better techniques. I need to get to implicit measures maybe, or I need to get to something where it's profoundly better than the insights that are out there that my CEO is listening to. Problem with that is the CEO doesn't care about how you got that. What the CEO really wants to do is actually drive to a sale. So out of all this morass, of all the insights, we're focused, I think, on the wrong thing. Ultimately, what he wants to be able to do is look at something and say, you know what, my insights group, or maybe marketers, they developed this thing, and this thing, this display, this website, this product, this package, actually drove sales. I believe implicit research leads to that. It leads to that because we understand now the behavioral factors that drive a person's behavior. So once you know that, now you can actually go and do behavioral techniques and behavioral design to actually go and drive a human behavior. How do tactics work in industry, right? How do we get to these tactics? Research just gave me some great behavioral implicit research. Well, it's the second part of this antiquated um, economy we have here. It's over on this side called traditional marketing. So here's what traditional marketing does. The agency. We hire agencies to be stewards of our brand. And that's good. That's exactly what they're supposed to do. So what they do is we spend lots and lots of money every year on our brands to now say, I want you to think differently about my brand. So we hire them and we pay millions of dollars to get awareness of our brand out there so that you will think differently when you're at the point of decision in front of a, uh, in front of a shelf set and you're going to prefer my brand over somebody else's brand. They're very good at doing that. Most agencies are very good at doing that. The problem is I don't believe preference is the number one way to get somebody to actually buy you. I know it's not the most efficient. For sure, thinking differently is not the most efficient way to get to a sale. Why? Because the behavioral and decision scientists clearly show us that our preferences change all the time. Our preferences change based upon you know, things in the environment, the context, how I'm feeling at the time. So for you to try to get me to think differently at the point of sale, you've lost me. Because thinking differently just for this one moment could change dramatically based upon how I'm feeling at the time. We can't stand to think differently. In fact, in fact, we have mental models and the non-conscious forces us all the time to try to use the same old thing you've been doing again and again. Because thinking differently is hard work. And we don't like to do hard work non-consciously. So here's what I would tell us. I think that we must evolve, our industry evolve. And from this idea that you know, my job back at Pepsi was to go build brands, or maybe, maybe, maybe a you know, build, build retailer brands a little bit here and there. The idea is that I was the architect, as best possible, to go create this brand preference. So I'd help my brands design new innovations, do shopper marketing, and create these incredible experiences via brand design. What I would suggest to us is that we actually have to start thinking about context and thinking about building choice via behavioral design. We have to evolve what we're doing. This idea would be a reframe. It's just that we have to reframe ourselves as this idea. So my group provides strategic insights to an organization to something that's more meaningful to a CEO. It says, no, no, our job, our reframe is about designing behavioral change. We are behavioral change agents. That's what my group does, right? That's what your group should be doing too. Why? Because if you're behavioral change agents for your company, then first off, it's open space. Nobody's doing it. Ad agencies aren't doing it at all. You guys in this room, we study human behavior all the time. We're the most qualified to do behavioral design. It allows us to provide more influence to the organization, more opportunities for sure, and also more impact. Because now a CEO can say, yes, Insights, my behavioral design group or my behavioral insights group came in and they designed this display. That display increased revenues by x. Right? That's what they're looking for. So if you're going to join me on this journey, I would suggest there's five rules of effective behavioral design that we see um, in the marketplace today. First one, adopt a model. So here's what happens a lot of times. Um, you guys will come to a presentation, you'll read a book in the behavioral sciences, and something that Danny Rielli wrote up, and you'll go, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I was, in that, I was in that camp. The problem with that is that you go out and you do an experiment. I was lucky enough to have a design laboratory where I could actually do experiments. 
And sometimes I'd get really bad results. They didn't make any sense to me. If you don't have a behavioral model, you can't actually go back to your results and figure out what went wrong. So you gotta have something to rely on. Here are four models up here um, that, that, that you, could, you could latch onto. All have pros and cons. We have our behavioral model, prime frame trigger. You have the hook model. You have the habit loop from Duhigg. Um, fog behavioral model. It doesn't really matter which model you use um, with, within reason. Um, just have something so that you can actually go back to your interventions if you're going to do some behavioral design, look at it and be able to post-analyze what went wrong or what went right with your, with, your, uh, with your work. So the thing I would ask you to do is first adopt a model. Second thing, when you're starting to look at your creative or designing your creative, have a purpose behind every creative element. This is one of the biggest things that we see when, um, when we look at other people's research, or I'm sorry, other people's design work. So every behavior you have, every behavior you take, has a purpose behind it, a key motivation. So in this case here, we have uh, two brands. We have Nike and we have Under Armour. We can debate positioning and brand equity. At the end of the day, for the most people, both those brands are about performance, sports performance of some kind, right? On Nike over here, I would suggest in this activation anyways, very promotion focused motivation. You have Wayne Rooney. Wayne Rooney is a very kind of outspoken character, right? Arms out wide, red body paint, screaming, just do it. Very promotion focused type of advertisement. Same type of company, same goals that somebody's trying to reach. Under Armour, a little more prevention focused, right? So in prevention, you have Jean St. Pierre, kind of introverted kind of a guy, arms in, very looking directly into the camera, looking into your eyes. Protect this house, protect this house, right? Very different ways in to the same motivational goal. If you don't know the motivation you need to come up with, here's what could happen. Imagine you have this Wayne Rooney spot and you have protect this house. Doesn't feel right, right? Or you have the other thing. You have uh, the, the Under Armour arm, just do it, right? It's not exactly right. Not saying it's horrible, but you want everything to be very congruent so it all just feels natural. So have a purpose on everything you're doing. You want red paint for a reason. It could have been blue paint. Well, not in this case, because Wayne Rooney plays uh, for Manchester. But there are certain things that you're doing in your designs have a purpose behind everything you do. Number three, let's focus on fluency. Your job as a behavioral designer and a change agent is not just marketing, I would suggest to you. Um, marketing could be where you start, but think about the entire solution. So here's an example of a project that we did, actually Aaron Reed, um, we worked on this together back in the days at, uh, at Pepsi. Here's what we wanted to do. In this space, it is not my job to just only come up with new creative. That is a big part of my job. My job is actually to drive sales. How do I do that? I think about the total solution. So focus on fluency when you're thinking about your design work. Fluency in this case is we knew that we had a promotion focused motivation, motivational um, a field that we wanted to go after. So I use things in messaging to prime that. Green, you, can, you probably can't see it too much, but you have um, some messaging here that says, drive away a winner, fuel up, thirst down, drive away a winner, promotion of God. You, you have the guy with his arm up. All those things were deliberate tactical things we did in messaging to now feel as if yes, it's in the promotional space, check. Second thing we did, we have an offer, 55 cents off. In this offer, we were looking at using some, um, uh, some, uh, uh, a concept called hedonic bundling, a uh, behavioral intervention that we were working on. In this case, right, we could have messaged 55 cents off in many different ways. Save 55 cents off, save 22% off, who cares? The idea was that we wanted this to be in more of a promotional focused way of messaging it. So in this case, we said 55, 55 cents off, very deliberate in our copy there. Second thing we did was, okay, so we have all these things. You have to now put the products on the solution, on this barrel cooler, to go ahead and so it all kind of fits together. So this is very promotion, racing, championships, things like that. I have Doritos up on there. We have Funyuns. We have Ruffles, promotional types of brands. Imagine that same solution, and I threw a bunch of Sun Chips on it. Sun Chips is not a promotional brand at all. It wouldn't fit there. So what I want you to do is think about fluency. Start with the total solution and think of every piece, not just your marketing, the way you're messaging, as well as the products you have on there. Think of it as a holistic unit, because in your customer's mind, it is a holistic unit. It all fits together. Fourth, design from the behavior back. Love this study that was conducted by Brain Juicer. Um, they have a behavioral activation unit that does incredible things in the space of designing for behavioral change. Here's an example of, of thinking through from the behavior and working your way back. Here's what normally happens for agencies. Agency comes up with a big idea. So you may do a lot of research, come up with a big idea, then the big idea needs to be expressed in a 360 way, right? So how do I take this big idea and put it into retail? And I have to go figure that out. Behavioral design would suggest not to do that. You don't start with the brand when you do behavioral design. You start with the behavior and with the context in which that behavior takes place. 
So here's what they did. They had a client, uh, MasterCard, as well as Hunkamola. Hunkamola is the equivalent of Victoria's Secret overseas, right? High-end lingerie. Um, one of the best assignments I got to work on when I was there. I loved it. So I'll tell you about it. So here's what we did. My wife hated me. So what we had to do is said, MasterCard wanted a greater share of total transactions at Hunkamola to be MasterCard transactions. Traditional agency model would say this. OK, we want you to now think differently about MasterCards. I'm going to create some sort of a program or incentive structure to now, every time you use a MasterCard at Hunkamoller, you will get something off. OK. The problem is, if you watch women in, in lingerie stores, the last thing that they're thinking about is some sort of a program that will give me a point off or something if I use my MasterCard over a, a, a Visa or American Express. It, it's just not even meaningful in that context. It doesn't make any sense. Here's what they did with Brain Juice. How can we use priming in hot states to come up with the same type of behavior without trying to message our way into this behavior? Here's what we did. We did behavioral audits overseas to see when do we believe that women are in hot states when they're about to go buy lingerie. Bear with me, guys. We did our best. Window bill. So first off, a lot of times you're watching women, they're walking by, and sometimes they look to see something in, over in the glass for the lingerie store. There's a moment of pause, and they say, huh, I'm going to go there. A lot of impulse, impulsivity there. It was that moment I said, I think there's a hot state there. If I have a hot state, I'm more likely to be able to use a small intervention. In this case, it was just a prime here um, that we created with just the two circles together. No branding on that. Just two circles together. That's all I'm trying to do. I just want to create an association in a hot state. So when you look at that and go, huh, MasterCard may come into top of mind. That's all we did. We weren't trying to message our way. That in and of itself put a 2% uplift in Maestro purchases. Second place when women are most in a hot state um, is when they're in the changing room. Now, the two things going on in the changing room, you're either really excited about what you see or you're really mad about what you see, right? <laughs> so we thought, that's a great place for a prime. Now, this is a much bigger prime than we were trying to show, and actually much higher up on the window dressing or up on the, on the mirror, but we had a small prime up there as well. Just by having that prime in there, we had about a 3% uplift in Maestro purchases. Very, very, uh, very small intervention to get, create a really big behavioral change. Lastly was the cash desk. So, what happens is when you watch people in behavior, we did behavioral audits to, do, to look at this work. Women are in line, they're waiting through the queue, and they start questioning, should I buy this or not? You can almost see them looking at it, looking at the price tag. That scared us a lot, right? Because now, not only are you losing a MasterCard transaction, you're losing a total transaction. So we looked at this space, said, okay, this is where she's in a hot state. Now, what we decided to do is put, if you guys can see, we put the, uh, the prime over here, the sticker on the far right-hand side of the countertop, not in front of the register, because if you do it in the register area, the purchase is already made. She's probably going to her top of wallet card. It's the same card she uses all the time. You need to get that card thinking way behind the scenes. So what we did is rather than right at the register, you move that intervention over to the right when she's in a hot state. The hot state when she's sitting there making the decision of, am I really going to buy this or should I just go ahead and put this away? So it's understanding context and really focusing on the context where somebody makes a decision. And that's where we want to place primes, when they're in a hot state. By doing that, you see here we had some really significant uplifts and, and, uh, and helped uh, Maestro do quite a bit of uh, extra business. Last thing I tell you is don't limit your influence. Um, I tended to look at my job over there at Frito-Lay was I need to impact shopper insights, shopper marketing. That was my role for some reason. Change agents, behavioral change agents, you don't have to live under those constraints. You don't have to because nobody else is doing this type of work. So we'll have clients come to us all the time and say, you know what, Will, I hear what you said, but not for my category. I don't think my category works. Or maybe not for my business, because my business is very different. I would suggest to you it's not. It's not really that different. Behavioral design is just the idea of taking one behavior, by definition, by taking one behavior to a preferred behavior. It doesn't have to, anything to do with your sales or whatever. So if you're in a position where you want to take a behavior and take it to a more preferred behavior, I would suggest that behavioral research or behavioral design can help you. It's at least influential in that. So we have things like clients looking at online experience or maybe shopper experience. We do expect some of this stuff to work out. Also, you'd say, you'd say things like environmental design, um, working with your employees to make creative, more creative um, interventions and creative experience areas. Also, B2B marketing with you, Sam, D2C communications and Capital One. What I'm trying to suggest is there's a lot of companies that are in this space, and they're not thinking of themselves just around marketing. It's also experience designs, technology development, websites, et cetera. With that, what I would ask you to do is uh, I firmly believe, as I should, because I started my company around this idea, would be our future rests in our ability to not just understand. We're learning a lot about understanding, but also in the actual design, designing for behavioral change. Only people in this room can do it because nobody else really understands human behavior like we do. With that, you all go to lunch. Thank <laughs> you.